During the late Jurassic, much of Europe is covered in inland seas. In these vast archipelagos, dinosaurs are still present, but far less abundant. But the large stretches of shallow sea water are abundant, with small pterosaurs. From tiny islands to vast coastlines, you don't have to look far to find the long tails or toothy grins of a Ramphorhynchus. These early pterosaurs spend much of the day sleeping in trees or on rocky outcrops to stay safe from terrestrial and aquatic predators. Once dusk settles in, however, they begin to stir, flexing their jaws and stretching their wings that can get up to two meters in length. Once they take flight, they soar over the water to where they may find a meal. They hunt in shallow water, and there is plenty of space where reefs flourish just beneath the surface, providing the perfect environment for countless species of marine life. Using their excellent eyesight to find prey and the low light to conceal themselves, Ramphorhynchus deal death from above the waves. They do not skim across the water's surface like some modern seabirds. If they want to eat, they have to get wet. Most of the time, when they are flying overhead and they see a fish that is close enough to the surface, they dive headfirst into the water, tucking their wings close to their body before torpedoing down and snatching up their catch in their jaws. Once the prey is secure, they have to swim back to the surface and spread out their wings and flap them to get airborne again and hope the fish they caught isn't too heavy. Others take a more casual approach. If the surf is calm, the Ramphorhynchus will land on the water's surface and float there casually, waiting for anything to come into range before diving down and a few moments later, popping back up again, sometimes with a fish in their jaws. When it comes to such slippery prey, Ramphorhynchus are well equipped to secure a catch. Their beaks are lined with large forward-facing interlocking teeth. Anything caught in these jaws has no chance of escape. Small prey can be thrown down their throats with little issue, but some larger catches have to be flown back to land, such as a ledge or rock in order to get smacked against a hard surface in order to stop them from wriggling. Swallowing such a large catch can be difficult with such intrusive dentition, but once they force a meal into the back of their throats and it slides down their necks, a large meal can completely fill the Ramphorhynchus, meaning those lucky enough to score such a catch can return to their roosts in one sitting. These rich marine environments are often full of predators, and so the Ramphorhynchus mostly stick to the shallows, where the enormous marine reptiles can't access. Some, like the plesiosaurs, usually don't bother pterosaurs, as they are also fish eaters, and the Ramphorhynchus would be a mostly bony meal. Still, hunger can force animals to hunt anything they can get, so the small pterosaurs are always on alert, and it's often not the adult reptiles they have to worry about. Protected reefs and lagoons are often havens for young marine reptiles, of all different species, and even when small, many would be able to pull a fragile pterosaur to a watery grave. In one such lagoon, a dozen Ramphorhynchus are floating above and diving towards a patch of coral, and as one female dives and snaps up a meal, she is too focused to see the rest of the group has taken to the wing. As she turns to swim upwards, she now notices the vacant surface, and looking to her left, she sees something large swimming towards her, using four powerful flippers. She desperately tries to reach the surface, but her catch is weighing her down. She breaches, takes in a sharp breath, and flaps her wings to try and get airborne, but right as it seems she will make it, a pair of jaws lined with conical teeth comes up from the water and snaps shut, killing her instantly, and then disappears below the water with a slight splash. The attacker was a young Lyplurodon, about two meters long. He swallows both the Ramphorhynchus and the fish she caught, and lets out a satisfied rumble. He doesn't often eat pterosaurs, but when underwater, they are substantially easier to catch than fish or squid, but as he gets older, and outgrows his shallow home, he will stop eating Ramphorhynchus completely, moving on to bigger game. Above him, the vast numbers of Ramphorhynchus continue to plunder the sea for everything they can get. The inland seas are vast and rich, creating an ideal habitat for them, though one that is as dangerous as it is bountiful. 
Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the most well-known long-tailed pterosaurs, Rampharynchus. The first remains of Rampharynchus were discovered in 1825, where it was first thought to be a species of bird. It would receive a slew of renaming and recategorizing until 1861, when Sir Richard Owen himself would re-examine the remains and give it the name Rampharynchus, meaning big snout. Since then, many remains attributed to this genus have been found in England, Tanzania, Spain, and some of the most well-preserved remains have been found in Germany, including soft tissue impressions and corporalites. From Germany alone, there used to be five species of Rampharynchus, so in 1995, pterosaur researcher Chris Bennett published an extensive review stating that most of the differences between them were due to the size of the individuals, and that they were in fact the same species, just at different growth rates. This was accepted, and though Bennett didn't include those specimens found outside of Germany, he put forward that those should be considered intermediate members of the family. Over 100 fossils of Rampharynchus have been found, giving a good understanding of this pterosaur, from its diet, growth, and even possible sexual dimorphism. Rampharynchus was a pterosaur in the Rampharynchidae family and lived in the late Jurassic between 150 and 148 million years ago. In life, Rampharynchus grew to an average of 1.2 meters long from nose to tail, with a wingspan of 1.8 meters, possibly weighing only a kilo. It should be noted that one fragmentary fossil was estimated to have a wingspan up to 3 meters, though this was likely a rare, very large individual. Like most pterosaurs, Rampharynchus had long arms that had three reduced fingers, and the fourth largest finger, also called the wing finger, that extended out far longer than the rest of the arm. The wing was made out of skin, extended from the tip of the wing finger all the way down the body to the middle of the leg, creating a wide surface area for flight. Rampharynchus also had additional skin membranes stretching out from the inside of both legs, connecting to the tail. Like most small pterosaurs, Rampharynchus had a short neck that held a large skull. The skull was long, and both the upper and lower jaws were tipped at the end, with the lower jaw hooking upwards. Lining the jaws were large interlocking teeth that were long, curved, conical, and splayed slightly outwards. The jaws and teeth created a menacing-looking, highly specialized apparatus that was built to catch and hold onto slippery prey mostly consisting of small marine animals like fish and cephalopods. As it lived in a vast coastal environment, Rampharynchus had evolved such oversized teeth to give it the best chance of securing fast and slippery animals, so that once it sunk any of its teeth into a victim, they had next to no chance of escaping. This is proven from finding both fish and cephalopod remains in Rampharynchus abdominal cavities, as well as their corporalites, which is fossilized feces for those that didn't know. The rest of the skull contained multiple holes, for both the nostrils and for lightening its mass. Some fossils were so well preserved that scleral rings have been found in the eye sockets, showing that Rampharynchus had great vision and hinting that it may have been nocturnal, or that it was more active during times of low light. What you'll commonly see with pterosaurs that have large teeth and no crests is that they usually also have a long tail, and Rampharynchus was no exception. This tail made up almost half of the animal's length, and was very stiff with a tail vein on the end that was diamond-shaped in adults. It's likely the tail aided in steering while in flight, but also may have been used as a display structure. After Chris Bennett put all German Rampharynchus fossils into one species, research was done into the growth rate of Rampharynchus, and fortunately fossils have been found from all age groups. Rampharynchus hatched from eggs, and it took over three years for them to reach full size. This may seem fast, but most other pterodactyloids reach adult size in about a year. Not only that, pterodactyloids have determinant growth, but in Rampharynchus, it's unknown if its growth was either determinate or indeterminate, and may help explain that three-meter individual. This has given rise to the theory that Rampharynchus may have been ectothermic, or cold-blooded, However, Bennett stated that more research is needed in this regard. When they were young, Rampharynchus' skull was shorter with larger eyes, and its hooked beak was blunter and rounder. 
Though juveniles had the same amount of teeth as adults, as they grew the teeth became shorter and stockier, likely so that they could tackle larger and stronger prey, and also indicates that juveniles and adults may have had different dietary niches. This is supported by a 2020 study that concluded that Rampharynchus hatchlings were able to fly not long after hatching, as they likely weren't cared for by their parents. The tail also changed as they grew, going from an oval shape to a diamond shape, with the largest individuals having a triangular shape. Enough Rampharynchus remains have been found that paleontologist Peter Welther was able to distinguish two different types from the fossils. In terms of body types, there were those with slightly larger heads and those with smaller ones. A possible example of sexual dimorphism within the species, with it being likely the males had larger heads and the females had smaller ones. However, more evidence such as soft tissue impressions would be needed in order to prove this theory. But how did Rampharynchus hunt its prey? Many of you will remember walking with dinosaurs betraying them as skimmers, like the modern Rychops genus. But this involves a highly evolved set of adaptations to do so. It's far more likely Rampharynchus hunted like most other seabirds. Given its body plan, Rampharynchus may have either flown over the water and then dived in to catch prey with its long teeth and then risen to the surface and taken off from the water back into the air similar to what we see ospreys do. Along with that, they may have swam along the water's surface, like a seagull, using its short feet that may have been webbed to paddle around, before diving to catch a meal close to the surface. Many different seabirds do something similar, from kestrels to boobies, and it's clear that Rampharynchus was evolved for hunting aquatic prey. But it didn't always go the pterosaur's way, however. This incredible fossil shows the last struggle of a Rampharynchus and a large fish, called... Yeah, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. It appears that the Rampharynchus had just dived and caught a fish, which is still on its stomach, and then the fish had grabbed the Rampharynchus by its wing, and they had gotten into a struggle. The end result being that they descended into an anoxic body of water, meaning the fish had no oxygen, and both of them suffocated resulting in them being preserved in their final moments. Rampharynchus is an animal specially evolved to hunt small ocean food. During its time, most of Europe was a massive archipelago, and being able to fly and feed anywhere along this massive region means Rampharynchus was a highly successful genus that would have been a common sight in Europe and North Africa's late Jurassic ecosystem. But what do you think of Rampharynchus? And for my question of the week, in terms of efficiency, how do you think Rampharynchus's large, crazy-looking teeth compared to modern seabirds with their toothless beaks? What lesser-known pterosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.